This is a Robot Rediger production on simple machines. There are six different simple machines. We have the lever, the wheel and axle, the pulley, the incline plane, the wedge, and the screw. There's two families, the incline plane, the wedge, the screw. They're all members of one family. The lever, the wheel and axle, and the pulley are members of the other family. This video is going to concentrate on the lever, but we're also going to talk about mechanical advantage, ideal mechanical advantage. We're going to talk about efficiency, work, torque, uh, our moment. So let's get to it. So mechanical advantage. What is mechanical advantage? Well, we know what advantage is. You know that you have an advantage over somebody else, right? Well, now we're talking about a mechanical advantage. This is what simple machines are all about, is mechanical advantage. It's this ratio of the resistance force to the effort force, or the ratio of the effort and the resistance distances. These are the ratios that we want to look at. And it's a calculation, it's a unitless calculation, and it tells us a lot about the simple machine that we're designing or that we're using. Let's take a look at an example of mechanical advantage. We have a little ramp here. So the box on the left could be just picked up and lifted vertically, or we could instead slide that box up the ramp. All right, they're both gonna get to the same place. They both weigh the same amount. In both cases, you've done the same amount of work. Work I'm gonna define in just a few minutes. So what's the advantage to one versus the other? Well, this is a case of a four to one mechanical advantage. Let's take a look at the magnitude of the force. It's gonna take four times less force to slide this up the ramp than it would be just to pick it up. But you're gonna travel four times the distance. That is a four to one mechanical advantage for this ramp, for this inclined plane. All right, so I just said work. Work, that dirty four letter word. Work is the product of taking the force and multiplying it times the distance that the object traveled in the direction of the force. It's very important. If you notice, there's a little double line right there, right? There's double lines right here. And those double lines tell us parallel. So this distance is parallel to this force. So as we slide that along, we've traveled a distance D. We multiply that times the force that we traveled, and that gives us the work that we accomplished. So the product of the effort times the distance travel will be the same regardless of the mechanical system, right? So in other words, even though we're traveling four times the distance, it's one fourth the force. Or this one here, it traveled one fourth the distance, but it took four times as much force. Either way, work is the same value. So we don't get free work out of a simple machine. And work really is energy in this case. So we're not getting free energy out of this simple machine. We're just taking advantage by trading force and distance. One is the magic number, right? Um, you probably heard the one was the loneliest number. Uh, let's take a look at mechanical advantage. If we have a mechanical advantage greater than one, well, this means that we're gonna not have to put in as much force. And that's great, right? But the trade-off, of course, is this gonna be a greater distance. So greater than one, less force required, less effort force. What if it's less than one? Well, you're gonna need a lot more force. So where's the advantage in that? You don't have to have the same amount of distance. And it depends on your design. Some designs, if you want a lot, a, a lot of force and a short distance. And in other designs, it's the opposite. You wanna lower the force as much as possible and your trade-off, greater distances. And remember, mechanical advantage cannot be equal to or even less than zero. It's just a no-no. All right, so let's start with the ideal. Ideal mechanical advantage. So this is a mechanical advantage that's based on, like it says, their theory. We're looking at our design and we're seeing that one distance is, uh, is this and another distance is this. And you're wondering, I wonder what the mechanical advantage is gonna be of this simple machine that I'm creating here or a very complicated machine you may be. 
Well, you take the effort distance, you divide it by the resistance distance, and you come up with the ideal mechanical advantage. With that word ideal there, you're probably thinking to yourself, so this isn't going to be the real mechanical advantage, is it? And, and no, it probably won't. It most likely won't because there's always some loss. There's always some inefficiency in our engines, in our motors, in our systems. All right. So therefore, this mechanical advantage, the ideal mechanical advantage is never going to be quite the same as the actual mechanical advantage. So how do we get the actual mechanical advantage, you're asking? I'm glad you asked. We can do this by taking the resistance force and dividing it by the effort force. So this is a, as it says here, an inquiry-based calculation. We, we find this out through experimentation. Woohoo! We get to do an experiment. You take your simple machine and you figure out how much resistance force is there. And then you figure out how much effort force you have to put into it. You do the calculation and that's the actual mechanical advantage. Good? Good. So let's take a look at some levers. I told you this video is about levers, and here we are all the way into this so far, and I haven't shown you any levers. So let's take a look at some levers. What is a lever? Well, you're very familiar with levers. You've been using levers your entire life, and we can see here a first, second, and third class lever. So what do we need? We need a resistance force, we need an effort force, and we need a fulcrum. So this bar is going to have three different points of interest for us. So let's get right to it. Let's look at a first class lever. The first class lever has the fulcrum, ha well, I was about to say halfway. It doesn't have to be halfway. It could be much closer to the resistance or much closer to the effort. But the fulcrum is in between the effort and the resistance. You notice also that the effort and the resistance are pointing in the same direction. They're both pointing downward in this case. So that's what's going to happen with a first class lever. We're also going to have a change in direction. If you are pushing this lever downward, the other half of the lever is going to go upward. So oftentimes levers like this are not used so much for their mechanical advantage, but just changing the direction. Or we use it for the mechanical advantage and we change the direction. Also, you can see here we have a mechanical advantage of less than one and a mechanical advantage of greater than one right there. All right, so let's go on and move on to the second class lever. Oh, this should look very familiar to you. Remember seesaws in the playground? All right, yeah, you probably were already there on that one, right? So second class lever. So the second class lever, the fulcrum is no longer between the effort force and the resistance force. It's way the heck over here. Hmm, that's a curious thing to do but it gives us a lot of different opportunities. These always have a mechanical advantage greater than one. So the effort force here is always gonna be less than the resistance force here. So what does that mean? Well, it means we can lift heavy loads. This is the type of lever we use in a wheelbarrow. Imagine a wheel right here. Imagine a heavy load of cement or potting soil or what have you, and you lift on the handles here and you're able to lift this heavy load and have the wheel carry a lot of the weight and you can lift a lot more weight than you normally would be able to do. If there's a first class and a second class, the third class lever can't be far behind. Third class lever. Now what do we do? Well, the fulcrum again is way over off to one side, but we've switched. Now the effort force is close to the fulcrum. The resistance force is far away from the fulcrum. Well, what's that about? Well, this is going to give us a mechanical advantage of less than one. Always. Well, what is that good for? Well, when you sweep, when you're sweeping, this is the kind of lever that you're using. You hold the handle here at one end and you push with the, the effort force and here's the whisk of the broom. This can give you a big reach. You can get that broom to move a long distance by putting only in a short distance. Another third class lever, baseball bat, and a lot of other bats and clubs and stuff like that that are used in sports. We only want to put in a little bit of distance and we get a lot of distance out. It makes them very effective for sporting. Moment. Wait just a moment 
while I talk about torque. <laughs> Bad joke. With these levers, as we saw with the previous one, there's turning going on, right? There's turning going on. If we kept pushing on this, it would turn all the way around. Well, how do we measure this turning thing that's going on? Well, that's moment. And in this case, we're not interested in forces in the same direction of motion, but we're interested in forces that are perpendicular. All right, well, what does that mean? Let's take a look. So the moment is D, the distance from the pivot point towards the force, times that force. So you notice now the force is perpendicular to the distance that we're measuring. When we talked about work, they were in the same direction. This is also known as torque, like I said, and this makes things turn. You want to make something turn like the tires on your car, you need torque, all right? You want to go really fast, you need horsepower. But if you're not moving and you want to get moving, you got to get yourself some torque. And that's what people look for on those big giant trucks that, you know, those 18 wheelers that have huge loads in them. They have to have massive amounts of torque to get those things going. Otherwise, they're just sitting still. So let's do a lever moment calculation. We have an effort force of 15 pounds, five and a half inches away from the fulcrum, and there's some resistance force. Let's find out what we can find out. So the moment, D times F. Well, D is five and a half inches. F is 15 pounds in this case. So the effort moment, or the torque that we're putting into this system, is five and a half inches times 15 pounds. So we get an answer of 82.5 inch pounds. That also tells us that on this side, we have 82 and a half inch pounds. So this side has a torque of 82.5. This side has an eight, a torque of 82.5. Now, of course, this force is bigger, but the distance is shorter. And when you multiply this distance times this force, you get 82.5. When the effort and the resistant moments are equal, we say that the lever is in static equilibrium. So static, like static cling, static electricity, it's not moving, right? Equilibrium sounds like equal, right? It's a case of things being equal and not moving. So this is a condition where there are no net external forces acting upon the particle, or in our case, a rigid body. And the body remains at rest or continues at a constant velocity. So no acceleration, no changes in velocity. Here we have a case of static equilibrium. You know already that it's 15 pounds times 5.5. Now I'm telling you it's 36 and two thirds pounds on this side. So what's the distance here, all right? How big is this distance? Well, you can solve this by saying the effort moment and the resistance moment are equal to each other because we're at static equilibrium and we know this and we've already solved for the effort moment. We did that just a minute ago. So if we set these equal to each other, you should be able to solve for that distance right there. Pause the video and do that. Solve for the distance. So you should have just calculated the distance for this question mark. Let's find out if you got it right. So we already know it's 82.5 inch pounds and that that has to be equal to the 36 and two thirds pounds for the resistance times the resistance distance, this distance right here. All we have to do is rearrange this equation and solve for dr. We can do that by dividing by 36 and two thirds pounds. And we crunch that into our calculator and we get 2.25 inches. So whereas this was 5.5 inches, this is only two and a half here. Very good, if that's what you got for your answer. Let's take a look at ideal mechanical advantage. If we didn't stop this thing, this would travel all the way around in a circle, wouldn't it? And the resistance distance would also travel in the same direction, right? The effort force would travel all the way around here. The resistance force would travel here. They travel in the same direction or they travel in opposite directions. Well. They're traveling in opposite directions when we think of this as a rod, right? The resistance end is gonna go upward when the effort force goes downward, but they're both traveling counterclockwise. 
Now, of course, the circumference around a circle is equal to 2 pi r. We know that. And 2 pi r, in this case, r being the effort distance, right, that circle all the way around here, this radius here is the same as the effort, all right, the effort arm. Likewise, this is the same as the resistance arm. So we have a distance of the effort, 2 pi times the effort length, arm length. And for the resistance, we have 2 pi times the resistance arm length. Well, let's go ahead and figure out the ideal mechanical advantage by taking the effort distance and dividing it by the resistance distance. Well, is this going to come out any different than it did before? Well, we take 2 pi times the effort arm, divide that by 2 pi times the resistance arm, and you should notice that the 2 is going to cancel. The pi is also going to cancel. So what are we left with? Effort arm length divided by resistance arm length. So even though this is spinning all the way around the circle, it's still really the same equation. And we're going to see that's important when we talk about wheels and gears and sprockets. All right. So what about the actual mechanical advantage? Well, of course, that's the ratio of the resistance force divided by the effort force. And here we have 16 pounds of effort, 32 pounds of resistance. Again, we still have the 15 and a half inch to 2.25 inch ratio here. The actual mechanical advantage of this lever, 32 divided by 16, gives us a ratio of 2 to 1. What about the ideal mechanical advantage? All right, pause the video, solve it, and come back and see if you got the right answer. All right, now that you're back from pausing the video, let's take a look. The ideal mechanical advantage, of course, is the effort distance divided by the resistance distance. And we just plug in our values, the effort distance 5.5 divided by 2.25, and we get 2.44 to 1. Interesting. They're not equal. So the actual mechanical advantage is not as good as the ideal mechanical advantage. The ideal mechanical advantage is a little bit larger, but we're not getting that. Wouldn't it be interesting, wouldn't it be great if we had a way to describe that? We do, and it's called efficiency. So efficiency is the ratio of the actual mechanical advantage divided by the ideal mechanical advantage, and we multiply the whole thing times 100 so that we can talk about percentages. What's the efficiency of the lever on the previous slide. So let's go back. Here's the equation for efficiency. Here is what we found, right? Two to one divided by 2.44 to one. Pause the video and calculate the efficiency. All right, now that you're back, let's find out. So the actual mechanical advantage, of course, was two to one. The ideal mechanical advantage was 2.44 to 1. So we need to divide the 2 by the 2.44. Multiply that times 100, and we get our answer. And that is 82%, which isn't too bad. That's not too bad when it comes to efficiency. Uh, engines in your car, not nearly as good as that. When it comes to automotive engines, the average efficiency is right around 20%. Ugh, not that great because they give up a lot of heat. They give off a tremendous amount of heat for the horsepower they get out. So what about electric motors? Electric motors, the maximum is right around 75%, which sounds really, really good. Not always going to run at 75%. They may be closer to 50%, but still better than the 20% we get with an internal combustion motor. No machine is 100% efficient. Thank you for listening to another Robot Reading Group production. This video was about simple machines, an ideal mechanical advantage, actual mechanical advantage. We talked about work. We talked about efficiency. And we talked about torque. Thank you. I'll see you next time.